Hello everyone, my name is Carter Melton and today we will be discussing the process of standardizing your flow cytometry workflow. These principles will apply to various flow cytometry platforms, but I like to break the process down from the ground up and review all the steps required to grow and automate your flow cytometry workflow while achieving reproducible results. A few of the main topics that we're going to cover in this webinar include how to develop and implement standardized protocols, what to consider to scale up your assays, how to use software and technology to automate your workflow, and we will have a brief summary and some time for questions at the end. Before we jump into our first topic, let's visualize the story of constructing a standardized flow cytometry workflow. The process is probably going to begin with a lot of optimization and design on a small scale to enable standardized reproducible results, meaning you want to ensure that you have good flow data on a single flow cytometer and a good workflow before scaling this out to multiple devices or to multiple sites, because it probably won't look any better after you scale it out. The same applies for automating sample acquisition, you want to start with making sure everything looks good on a small scale, probably within a single tube, before you try to expand that assay to acquiring from multiple samples with higher throughput. And then finally, flow cytometry is subjective. So you want to make sure you get reproducible data within a single operator before trying to scale out that assay to multiple operators or technicians, especially if it won't be flow experts running that final assay. So the end goal is to have standardized reproducible results throughout your flow cytometry workflow. Standardizing your flow cytometry workflow involves identifying and addressing some main sources of variability. These sources may include your starting material, meaning you might have differences in your starting sample. This could be donor to donor, organ or tissue differences if your samples are coming from maybe a mouse or an animal model it could be a different level of five bull cells or amount of debris and really your starting material will determine how much sample processing you have to do prior to flow there are also differences in reagents your antibodies your floor floors not all dyes are created equally so we want to select good reagents to minimize variability downstream when it comes to protocols you might have your gating or your hierarchy your experiment setup and just setting up your flow cytometer in general we want to really minimize variability in the protocol itself instrumentation flow panels are specific to the flow cytometer's optical bench, so you can't really just transfer flow assays between different optical configurations without some considerations. So if you do have the same optical bench, how can you harmonize a flow assay between different flow cytometers as you scale up? So there are some variabilities in instrumentation that we will discuss as well. And finally, when it comes to analysis and reporting, we want to have a standardized gating approach with different flow and control. As I mentioned, flow cytometry is subjective, especially when it comes to where to place gates. So we want to minimize variability in operator to operator bias in gating, or even things like compensation that can, are a little more technical and can introduce more variability. We've already discussed about how you probably want to start off small and make sure that things are optimized within a single operator, a single device, and while acquiring from a small number of samples before scaling up to multiple devices, multiple operators, and higher throughput. So along this workflow, I like to visualize things according to three categories. First, we have kind of pre-flow cytometer. Is that There's a lot of design in the protocol regarding sample prep, gating strategies, and your flow panels that you can really optimize and discuss before even getting to your flow cytometer. There are some flow controls such as staining, gating, and compensation controls that you can run on the actual cytometer the day of the experiment to help reduce some variability and 
enhance your standardization. And then finally, as you begin to scale up and out, there are different considerations for calibration between devices or within a device, automation of the workflow, and even validation of the results that you are getting to make sure that you have equivalent results among different sites or devices. Let's first talk about our protocols. And this, as I mentioned, are things like sample prep, gating strategies, and our flow panels. You might be wondering, why is sample preparation crucial to our flow assay? If we think about what's happening on the inside of our flow cytometer, as the cell sample is taken up, we are able to focus our cells into a single file line through hydrodynamic focusing, meaning we have sheath fluid flowing at a separate velocity than our cell sample, and due to the principle of laminar flow, these two streams will not mix, and this allows us to individually interrogate our cells in our flow cell by our laser. So we do want to minimize any sort of cell clumping to, and have that nice single cell suspension. So depending on if your cells are adherent or they clump, you might need some sort of enzymatic or mechanical digestion to get to that single cell suspension while maintaining a high cell viability and also preserving the epitopes on the surface of the cell. We do have a few gating strategies on your flow cytometer to visualize or remove those unwanted events, such as debris or dead cells from your analysis. The first is the debris exclusion gate. This is typically placed on forward scatter versus side scatter, and this is a relative estimation of cell size and cell granularity. We can gate out the really, really small events with no granularity, as this is likely debris or noise in your system. You may also want to set a threshold appropriately to limit the event rate on your cytometer for good data quality as well. Next, we have a singlet gate for doublet exclusion. This is a method for gating on single cells and for excluding doublets or clumps of cells as they come through your flow cytometer. Typically, a clump of cells will take longer than a single cell to pass through the laser and Using this longer time of flight, we can exclude those doublets or clumps from analysis with some sort of area versus height or similar gate as seen in this single cells gate. Finally, we can gate out our dead cells with some sort of viability gating. Dead cells have a compromised cell membrane, so we can use a DNA dye like PI, 7AD, or DAPI to stain those dead cells and they will freely go through the compromised membrane whereas living cells will not take up the dye so this is a way to exclude dead cells based on their DNA dye expression and there are also different viability dyes out there like the amine reactive dyes so this is a method for excluding those dead cells which can be sticky and bind antibodies non-specifically. The next thing we can think about before even getting to our flow cytometer is the flow panel itself and a little bit about panel design. So when thinking about a flow panel, this is the process of choosing your antibodies and matching them with their floor floors. So you could have a flow panel like CD3 FITC, CD4 PE, and CD8 APC just three common markers and three very common floor floors. Or you could have a flow panel like CD4 FITC, CD8 PE, and CD3 APC. Not every flow panel is created equally, so it's good to have a nice robust flow panel to begin with before we think about even scaling up our assays. Now we won't spend too much time on the topic of panel design today, but the last thing you want to try and do is scale up and scale out a poorly designed flow panel. So to ensure you have a well-designed panel to begin with, there are two basic rules of thumb. The first is to just spread out your floor floors among your lasers and among your channels to minimize spectral overlap. This will be easier to do with the less floor floors in your panel. So as you have more complex flow panels with more and more colors, 
this will get harder to do and proper flow panel design practices will be more crucial. Another concept is to just pair your bright floor floors with your dimly expressed antigens. This pairing process up front can help make more robust panels over time. Looking at the topic of dimly versus brightly expressed antigens, we typically consider antigen expression in tertiary, secondary, and primary levels. And this just means that if we took the same floor floor, something like Fitzy, and stained our cells with that floor floor, there are more binding sites depending on these three levels of expression. And looking at fluorescence intensities for these three situations, you're just gonna have a higher fluorescence intensity due to the fact that we have more Fitzy floor floor molecules on the cell surface. So this is a pairing process where typically you want to pair bright fluorochromes with dimly expressed antigens and highly expressed antigens with dim fluorochromes. So you might not know how well expressed your antigen is, but you can do some research in the literature. And then typically you can find out how bright a floor floor is dependent on your cytometer's optical bench with some research online. So I would recommend following these panel design guidelines up front before you begin scaling up and out. When designing our flow panel, we also need to select the appropriate antibodies, meaning we want to maximize specificity of our antibody while minimizing any no sort of nonspecific binding. Looking at the antibody layout, we normally have these variable domains, F, V, and these will determine what epitope or antigen your antibody is specific for or what it will go and bind. You have this constant domain down here, and this is the antibody backbone. We want to maximize specific binding binding specifically to the correct antigen, as the name implies. As you can see, this is a good fit. We are binding what we're supposed to bind. However, there are cases of non-specific binding, such as binding of the incorrect antigen on the cell surface, even if it is by the variable domain. We have FC binding, and this is could be some sort of binding to that constant domain. Certain cells like monocytes are especially prone to this, and this is why you might want to do some sort of FC blocking step. And then if your antibody is conjugated to a fluorofluor, you can have some sort of fluorochrome sticking. And this can be worse depending on whether or not the fluorochrome is a tandem as tandem dyes can be more prone to fluorochrome sticking. So these are all considerations for choosing your antibody fluorofluor conjugate. When choosing your antibodies, not all antibodies are created equally. Historically, we had polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. Polyclonal antibodies were all specific to the same target antigen, but maybe not the same exact epitope and that had higher lot-to-lot -lot variability. Monoclonal antibodies are all specific to the same target and the same epitope. And now we have what's called recombinant antibodies. And these are recombinantly engineered antibodies to have the same high purity and the lot-to-lot -lot consistency. And these are recombinantly engineered to have no FC receptors, so you won't have to do any sort of FC binding. They have a very specific antigen binding site that is defined on the DNA level. And we're gonna talk about isotypes. They have the same universal isotype control because it has that same FC region. So these are kind of the next evolution of antibodies to give you lot to lot consistency and purity. After you've chosen your floor floors and your antibodies for your flow panel, it also is important to titrate your antibodies to ensure consistent performance over time. And what a titration is, it's all about varying the antibody concentration while keeping the incubation temperature and the incubation time constant. So you will need to find a temperature and a time that works well for whatever cells you're staining and keep that constant while varying your antibody concentration 
to maximize what's called your staining index. So you would add maybe a two-fold dilution of your antibody to see what gives you the best staining index. And all the staining index is, is the separation between your positive and your negative signal while dividing by two times the standard deviation of your negative. So essentially maximizing separation between the positive and the negative and minimizing the standard deviation of your negative population. That's the purpose of a titration and performing this will help give you consistent results over time. So on to our next kind of section, we have talked about protocol design and kind of pre-flow cytometer things that we can consider to scale up our assays to give us standardized results. So now let's talk about some flow controls that we can run alongside our actual samples to help us with staining, gating, compensation, and a few other things. The first kind of control we can discuss is the isotype control. This is control to estimate non-specific binding of your antibody. With an isotype control, this variable region or the binding region has been removed so that any binding we see is a result of non-specific binding. Meaning it could be just binding to the cell surface at the incorrect epitope. It could be FC binding if you did not perform an FC step or the amount of fluorochrome sticking. So the concept is it's essentially the same exact antibody fluorofluor conjugate as the actual antibody in your flow panel, but there's no variable region, so there should be no specific binding. So it is very important to add the same amounts of isotype as the primary antibody, and this means adding it in terms of micrograms, not microliters, because they might not necessarily they might not necessarily be at the same concentration. And it is also important to match your antibody background, backbone, if it's IgG, IgA, IgM, and then also whether it's IgG1, IgG2A, because this is how you will match that amount of non-specific binding by the backbone. So this is also where the reaffinity antibodies are advantageous, is that they are all the same IgG1 backbone, so you just need one isotype control for each floor for used. The next controls that we have are called our FMOs or fluorescence minus one. So these are controls used to set your gates appropriately. So essentially they are all of the antibodies except for the floor floor or antibody floor floor conjugate you're trying to set your gate on. So why is this better than an unstained sample? If we look at an unstained sample, maybe PE versus FITSI, we might want to set our PE gate. And then looking at the fully stained sample with that gate set all over here based on our PE gate, I'm not sure I like where that gate is set. My CD3 positive cells, it looks like I'm incorrectly setting that gate. So instead, we can have what's called an FMO. And this is the same exact sample but stained with everything but that CD4 PE. So it's essentially just leaving a single floor floor out. And you can see how the gate set on my unstained sample is different than the gate I would set on my FMO. And just applying that FMO gate, it looks a lot better on my fully stained sample in the middle for determining my CD4 PE separation than the gate I set on my unstained sample. So FMOs help account for any sort of spreading introduced by the other floor floors in the panel that you wouldn't necessarily see in the unstained sample. And you would want to have an FMO for each color in your panel. And as you kind of begin to scale up and go down the line, you might find out that certain floor floors, you don't really need an FMO, especially if you have a distinct on-off separation because uh, you can imagine how many more antibodies you will have to add as you have more and more FMOs. Another form of control that we can run is something like a normal control, where this can be analyzed alongside your test sample as kind of a reference normal sample, where this could have expected frequencies, counts, or statistics. 
If you did generate this in-house, it could be a sample that you thaw consistently that gives you the same results on your cytometer day to day. That way, if the normal control sample looks weird, then you know something's off on your flow cytometer. However, if your test patient data looks weird, but your normal control does fall within those predefined specifications, then you know it probably just is a weird patient sample because everything within your normal control does pass and fall within specification. Another sample you can look at is the unstained sample. We saw that it's not always the best for setting your gates. However, an unstained sample is important, especially if you have autofluorescence in your cells because that's the way that you can estimate the amount of autofluorescence. And it can also be used to set forward scatter and side scatter appropriately, especially if maybe your test sample is precious or you have very precious antibody and you don't want to use that sample for optimization. An unstained sample is typically a good practice to run alongside your fully stained sample, your isotype, and your FMOs. The last control we will review are the compensation controls. And this is for estimating the amount of spillover from floor floors into their non-primary channel. And the, you will need a, one single color control for each color in your panel. And the good thing is that cells or beads can be used as a carrier for that floor floor as long as you have a matched autofluorescence for your negative and your positive control. And it is best practice to have an MFI brighter or as bright as your cell sample if using a surrogate marker or beads. And keep in mind that tandem floor floors do require special considerations because there will typically be a different amount of spillover into that donor floor floor channel, depending on the lots, the degradation of the exact floor floor. So just be careful when you are using tandem floor floors. And the goal is to have properly compensated data as we can see on the right with compensated versus non-compensated. And I would argue that it is very important to have some sort of automated compensation program for your cytometer, meaning you don't want to have your operator or your technician manually compensating your data because that is a very high form of subjectivity. But the process of compensation would be looking at uncompensated data. We might look at FITSI signal in primary channel B1 versus spillover into secondary channel B2. In this case, you can see that your FITSI positive has a higher MFI than your FITSI negative in that B2 channel. So the goal of compensation is to make those MFIs equal. So if we can, instead of having an operator do this by eye, have some sort of machine that we supply our single color controls to the flow cytometer and it automatically will calculate all the compensation required, that is going to reduce the subjectivity and help standardize your workflow because compensation is one of the more technical components of flow cytometry. So with some sort of automatic compensation program, you can reduce that subjectivity over time by taking it out of the hands of the humans and letting the robots do it. We've talked a little bit about protocol design up front and things pre-flow cytometer. We've discussed a little bit about your flow controls and things that you can run alongside your actual test samples to really ensure standardized results. And then now we can talk about scaling up and out, things like calibration of your device, different levels of automation and validation of your flow assays. Let's first look at calibration and let's talk about intra-instrument calibration or just calibrating the same cytometer over time. So with the process of calibration, you typically need some sort of reference calibration beads that act as a lighthouse because depending on how many channels you have on your flow cytometer, you want to maintain the same performance over time. So you can use calibration beads that have a defined fluorescence intensity or an expected fluorescence intensity. 
And if we look at a cytometer on day one, maybe we have a set target 100 MFI. Running these beads and calibrating this device for a single channel would automatically adjust your PMT voltage to make sure that we hit this same 100 MFI over time. So this is a way that, let's imagine that this takes 500 volts to get there. Day 1000, at that same 500 volts, due to any sort of PMT degradation or just PMT drift over time, might give you a lower MFI. So we can have a calibration process to increase that voltage to make sure that we get that same MFI day one and on day 1000 because we don't care about what the voltage is. We care about what the output of the PMT is and that means MFI. So this is a way that you can have an automated calibration process that will check your staining index, your percent CV, your noise because it if you don't have an automated process, then this can be very tedious where you'd have to run reference beads, adjust the voltages manually to hit that same MFI each day to uh, respective of each channel. And as you have more channels, more devices, this can become very tedious. So that's why it's recommended to have some sort of automated calibration process on your flow cytometer. For instance, on the MaxQuant, 10 flow cytometer, we have our calibration beads. And these have a small bead and a big bead. The big bead has a set fluorescence or set MFI in each channel. So the max quant flow cytometer will actually check each one of your channels and ensure that we have sufficient separation between our positive peak and our negative peak. And you can see it on the left hand side of your plot. And it will check that daily and adjust your voltages to make sure that we hit that same target MFI while also checking things like the staining index to make sure that we have sufficient separation for that particular channel with our reference bead. And this also gives you a nice passing result because the last thing you want to find out is that maybe a laser died on your flow cytometer or PMT is out and you want some sort of daily calibration to verify that everything is functioning because you don't want to see something weird in your data and then have to backtrack to see oh my machine wasn't actually fit for use and that's why my data looks weird this calibration process would look similar if you're calibrating inter instruments or between different devices so this would be dependent on the devices having the same optical configuration because you can't really harmonize a flow assay between two different optical benches as it just probably wouldn't look the same data wise. So let's imagine that we want to harmonize our data between three different devices. We're able to use the same calibration process and maybe these three devices take a different voltage to get to that same target MFI because the PMTs within these devices are independent and need independent voltages for the same MFI. So what we can do then is that assuming these reference beads are a form of lighthouse, we can normalize this to a value of 400. And this is all due to the fact that we have a linear region in our PMT where we have an expected MFI increase with a corresponding voltage increase. So with this process, we are now normalizing our three flow cytometers to the same calibration reference beads. And it's more or less than that any adjustments becomes an offset from the daily calibration. And this is where it is very dependent on being within this linear region of your PMT, which is taken care of by your daily calibration. And this process is even more tedious to do manually between devices as it is within a single device over time. So relaying back to the idea of having some sort of automated process to do this for you is the end result or the end goal. And if you have our MaxQuant flow cytometer, this is exactly what our smart gain technology allows us to do. It allows us to optimize instrument settings on a single MaxQuant device and transfer those settings with our smart gain technology to allow reproducibility from 
test to test within a single flow cytometer, user to user within a single cytometer as well, and also instrument to instrument. And it really would matter whether or not those instruments are right next to each other or if they're across multiple locations due to the fact that we are calibrating and harmonizing our devices to the same reference calibration beads. What would this look like from a data standpoint? You can see that within a single instrument, day zero to day 10 to day 20, a year later, overlaying all the data, since we're making sure those channels or PMTs are calibrated to the same reference MFI every day, we would have the same MFI for our actual test data, considering everything else is the same, just making sure equivalent performance within your device and then we would also have the ability to optimize everything on one device, transfer those instrument settings from device to device, and running the same sample on different devices could overlay that data, all due to the fact that we are calibrating our devices to the same reference speeds. When we think further about scaling up and out, I like to think about scaling up as going from maybe single tubes to requiring maybe from a, an entire rack of tubes to 96 wall plates or 384 wall plates. Basically higher throughput within a single flow cytometer. Then also we can scale out, meaning we can scale out to different cytometers at different sites across the US or across the world. And the goal is to have the same reproducible results among different operators, among different sites, whether or not we're acquiring from a plate or a tube and just have the same exact standardized reproducible results. So there are some other considerations as we think about scaling up and scaling out that we're gonna talk about. The first consideration for scaling up might include making some sort of antibody cocktail as opposed to adding each antibody or dye to the, each tube independently. Normally, if you have a small number of samples, you might just be adding two microliters of each one of your fluorochromes to each tube independently, but this can be very tedious, time consuming, and prone to errors. You might want to instead make an antibody cocktail where you would add all of your antibodies to maybe a microtube and mix them all together. And then you can scale up, meaning that if you had these four antibodies for one sample, you could make you know, enough for one sample, you'd add 100 microliters per well. For five samples, you could add enough to be able to basically make a cocktail of your antibodies. And then from that cocktail, you'd add 100 microliters to each well, and this can ensure consistent labeling and making sure that there were no antibodies left out. And I always like to also and maybe multiply each antibody volume by a certain factor because the last thing you want is when you get to that last well and you realize that, oh, I lost some volume on the sides of the tube, I don't have 100 microliters to add. It's always good to have a little bit of excess cocktail volume to have. Another thing to consider is that whenever you're scaling up to staining in small, smaller volumes, the final antibody concentration is more important than the actual volume of antibody added. So for example, if you're adding 10 microliters of antibody to 1 million cells in 500 microliters of final staining volume, if you're trying to scale things and maybe stain in smaller volumes, you wouldn't add that same 10 microliters to 100 microliters final staining volume. You would maintain the antibody concentration. So you would only add two microliters to that 100 microliters final staining volume because it's the concentration that is important. As we think about scaling up to a 96 well plate, we might need to consider some dyes like viability dyes. Some of these, like 7AD or PI, you might add directly to your tube or your well and either acquire immediately or only incubate for five minutes and not really need a washing step. This is easy to do for single tubes or acquiring a small number of samples, but as you think about acquiring or adding 
a viability die to a 96 well plate, that last well acquired might have a lot longer of an incubation time and have a lot more background staining or your live cells might start taking up that dead cell die because they're just sitting in it for so long. So you might think about some sort of auto labeling function depending on your cytometer. Our max quant has this needle arm that is used from acquiring from your single tube, your 96 rack, your multiple 5 mil fax tubes, but this needle can also add reagents for you or auto label for you. It's basically a little liquid handling system. So imagine that you had something like 7AD. You could put it in this universal reagent rack next to your plate and you could program the max quant to say I want to add PI to every single one of my wells and I want to incubate for five minutes before acquiring. It is smart enough to actually add PI and stagger those addition times to make sure that every well has the same five minute incubation. So it does know how long to wait before adding the viability dye to each well to ensure it has enough time to acquire the samples before it and also ensure that every well has the same five minute incubation. So a great way to use technology to automate our workflow and give us a more standardized incubation time when it comes to things like viability dyes. And also you might want to have some sort of automatic mixing to keep your cells in suspension, especially if they are prone to settling, maybe in a 96 well plate, if they're sitting there for a long time, they might start to settle or re-adhere to the plate, and then also some sort of automated washing between your samples to ensure that there is minimal sample to sample carryover. As we think about running multiple experiments and really maximizing throughput, you also aren't limited to running a single flow panel per plate. You do have the ability to program and run multiple panels on a single plate automatically, meaning that you could divide an entire 24 samples automatic acquisition, have maybe flow panel A on the left hand side, flow panel B on the right hand side, and you could have maybe your triplicates in these rows and your test conditions and your controls all pre laid out that way it's very reproducible you can just run this assay and you can actually program each well to have a different analysis template maybe it needs different voltages you can really just reduce your operator hands-on time for setup and switching plates because you could put this on two different plates whereas you could program this to a single plate with two different panels and automate everything in a single acquisition just to reduce any hands-on operation time. There are a lot of considerations as we scale up and out, but all of these are just making sure that we get the same results that are reproducible and standardized throughout the process. And we do need to show that through the process of validation. The first thing you probably would like to see throughout your flow cytometer runs is that we have repeatability, which is intra-assay precision. And this means that we are not changing any variables between these runs. You have the same operator on the same flow cytometer, running the same sample on the same day. And it's really just looking at the percent CV of individual replicates. You may want to repeat this run multiple times that way you're not just running it a single day. And looking at this, you might have three different runs with the same sample, the same operator, the same flow cytometer. And within that, you'd have individual percent CVs within runs. And then you can also have a between run overall percent CV to kind of see your intra assay percent CV. You may next want to look at inter-assay precision, and this is known as intermediate precision. This does require a variable change between your runs, so this means changing your operator to make sure that two operators give you the same results. You might want to analyze the same sample with the same operator, but on two different flow cytometers to see if there is variability between the two flow cytometers, 
and maybe just simulate different days of acquisition to ensure that we have standardized reproducible results day to day and this is where something like a calibration can be crucial and with this you would likely look at the percent of your means to see the amount of intermediate precision and with this you can change a number of variables but i recommend things like operator to operator device to device and to day to day to day as the variables that you change one method to reduce the operator to operator variability in analysis is with some sort of automated analysis so with what we call our express mode gating we have the ability to automatically place our gates and this reduces human error due to reduction in subjectivity due to the operator bias and these are application dependent meaning that they can be customized to your exact flow panel or there are some commercial off-the-shelf express modes that go hand in hand with pre-designed flow panels and they place the gates with different algorithms for different distributions so it's not just snap gating and that means that if we look on the right there on day one the gates may look great but on day 50 they may not apply still so the express mode gating can automatically adjust that gate for you based on different algorithms that is application dependent and this simplifies the workflow for the operator because it can give you immediate results and automatically place those gates increasing productivity and also giving you reproducible results because two technicians applying the same algorithm based gating will have identical results because it's placing those gates automatically without operator intervention and just looking at an example of an express mode analysis this is one of our commercially available amino phenotyping express modes in which you can take whole blood stain it directly and it will automatically give you some dot plots with gating placing all of those gates for you automatically based on the different distribution and populations it gives you a table with statistics for each cellular population and it also gives you a nice easy to read cell type gating hierarchy frequency and concentration of each population and what's really nice is that this is able to be automatically exported to an excel sheet or to a pdf for really just automated reproducible results and as i mentioned this will give you the same exact data in the hands of two different technicians running the same algorithm because it's just based on the raw data itself another method to really reduce subjectivity is to incorporate some sort of liquid handling system and as you can see on the right here this is an example of our max quant flow cytometer connected to a liquid handling system this can automate things like sample prep your cocktail creation sample staining and incubation it can even automate sample washing plate loading and acquisition as some do have a built-in centrifuge and incubator and really this is reduces the operator to operator variability with any sort of sample manipulation and staining protocols because with the robot making your cocktails for you you can assure that it has this correct volume each time and will reduce any sort of variation with operator to operator differences in pipetting in leaving an antibody out especially as you scale up and try to really automate the whole workflow a method to standardize the cocktail creation or the panel design process is to use some sort of pre-formulated panel or cocktail and what we have from milteni are called our stain express reagents these are dried down antibodies in a ready to use cocktail it's really nice you would just add your sample directly to the tube containing the antibodies and incubate directly in that tube so this is reduced variability in your cocktail creation and also sample preparation and handling so the manual workflow would be a lot of source of variability you would have to label your tube add each reagent directly mix add your buffer and manually set up everything for acquisition 
Whereas a stain express workflow would look like this, where you have your barcoded tube with your dried down antibodies ready to have your sample added. So after you add your sample, all you have to do is incubate. Then you can scan in the reagents you're using to automatically set up your analysis and your workflow on their max quant flow cytometer. So really just reducing a lot of the subjectivity and sources of error that can happen in the manual workflow. So paired with express mode analysis, this does give you fast, easy, and reproducible results from operator to operator. Other pre-designed panels include our MBTPs, which are the Miltini Biotech tested panels. You can find these online, but there are a number of them that provide you with a straightforward gating strategy, straining protocols, and a list of all important reagents, materials, whatever antibodies you may need. These are validated by our in-house experts to allow reliable and reproducible results, and they have been used by a number of our customers that have further validated them. Finally, depending on what kind of environment you're in, there might be some regulatory requirements. So you might want to consider FDA compliance in terms of 21 CFR Part 11 compatibility in which they want to see some sort of user management, meaning user and role management with rights management and a di digital signature for each data file. They also would like to see an audit trail that has secure tracking of all actions that has exportable results and advanced filter options and also an electronic record in which you can create a forgery proof pdf a with a digital signature that is digitally signed by the operator that is analyzing the data and this is available in our 21 cfr part 11 compatible max quantify software so you want to ensure that the software you're using for analysis is also compatible with your final downstream kind of end goal when it comes to your flow assay. And in summary, we talked a little bit about considerations pre-flow cytometer in terms of protocol design, sample to prep, gating strategies, and your flow panels. We discussed some flow controls that you can run as you're acquiring your data, such as your staining controls, your gating, and your compensation. And then finally, we had some considerations for scaling up and out and ensuring standardized reproducible data through calibration, automation, and validation of your flow assays. So that's everything I had. I appreciate everyone's time. And if there are any questions, I would love to review. My email is at the bottom in case there are any outstanding questions after the webinar.